So welcome everyone. My name is James Sarah. I am a data and solution, data and AI solution architect for Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for about eight years. I had a brief stop at UI. I'm in a part of Microsoft called Industry Service Solutions Delivery, which used to be called Microsoft Consulting Services. Basically, I help customers build solutions. Where in prior roles at Microsoft, I talked about building solutions. I educated customers on data architectures, and I still look at that today. It's a very popular topic now when we're talking about data warehousing, and we get into the data fabric. And the agenda for today is the modern data warehouse, data fabric, data lake house, and, the, and especially the data mesh on there. I've been doing this for quite a long time. I was a DBA for many years, a developer, an architect. I won't go back to my COBOL days, but I spend a lot of time speaking at user groups, and I have a blog that goes more into detail on a lot of what I'm talking to today. If you want information, you can also be feel free to email me. I'll have that at the end, and we'll, I'll also distribute out the deck for those that want to keep it. So as I mentioned, these will be the topics. I will try to, I will definitely take pauses a few times along the way to answer your questions. And I'll leave some time at the end for questions too. So you can just raise your hand or come off mute or put something in the chat room. I, I, there's a lot of buzzwords now when we talk about modern data warehouse, data fabric, data lake house, data mesh. And some people try to figure all these out on their own. And I like to play this video. It's sort of like you're climbing this mountain of knowledge. And just when you think you understand it and you have all the clarity on all these data architectures, that happens. And I'm going to try to prevent that today by giving you a high level understanding of what all these data architectures are. And I will say that this is my opinion. This is not indicative of what Microsoft as a company thinks. They they align pretty well, but they're I don't want people going, oh, Microsoft said this because James said it, but in reality, it's it's my view. And I'll talk a little bit near the end on data mesh and Microsoft's viewpoint of solving the data mesh. So I'd like to start this off for those that may not quite understand what a data warehouse is. These are all the reasons for having a data warehouse. Hopefully most of you are aware of these. This slide has been around for a dozen years probably when I had many times explained this to customers why you want to take it, why you want to create a data warehouse. And it hasn't changed other than you want to copy the data at the very least. And no matter what data architecture you're using, you never want to go right against the source system. So imagine you're using SAP or any other CRM or ERP type of solution and users are hammering away at it. And if you have a report running off of that, it could affect the people we're trying to do writes, deletes, and insert and updates to that data. So you want to copy that data. Now you want to do more than just copy it. You want to do things to it to make it easier for reporting. So you never want to combine one data warehouse or a database that has end users hammering away at it, doing transactional type type of things against that like adding customers, deleting, and inserting customers, and do your reporting on that database at the same time. So you copy it over and create a data warehouse. And when you copy it, you can do more things to it to make it easier for end users to query and create reports of that data. For example, you can rename the fields and the tables that may come from the source system. A lot of these ERP systems have very confusing names and sometimes numbers like T116. So you can rename those. You can clean the data as it moves over in there. You can combine it with many different source systems. Sometimes customers will have hundreds of source systems and they want to query all that together. So you put that in, inside of a data warehouse on there. You can do things like master and data management on there. You can build hierarchies on there. And in the end, you have this one location that has a, one version of the truth that end users can query all, data off of. So this is why you make a copy of the, of the data warehouse, of the, of the source data and, and pull it into a data warehouse. 
Now they get value out of the data. If you create a data warehouse, we call that a top-down way of getting value. And that's where you know the questions to ask up front, you know the type of reports you want. You do all this work up front to create this data warehouse. So I'm creating the database and the tables and the fields, writing the ETL, and they call that schema on right, because you're modeling it first and then you land the data. Another approach, a bottom-ups approach, which is used by a data lake I'll talk about in a second, is where you don't quite know the questions asked. Maybe you just want to investigate this data. And, and so you go and you have this data and you query it and you run another query and you're trying to find questions that will be relevant out of this data. And to do that, you don't want to spend all this work like you do in the top down. You just want to be very quickly, very quickly be able to query this data on there. And this is what we call scheme on read. Well, you'll model later, meaning I want to be able to just dump files somewhere and query them very quickly. So it's not much upfront work. Now, if I find value of that data, then maybe I move it into a, this relational data warehouse in there. But in the meantime, I can do a lot of things with that data without a lot of work. And this is where we come up with, whoops, the, this is where you think of the top down is a lot of times you're looking at history, historical trends. Why did something happen? What happened exactly on there? As opposed to a bottoms up approach where in many cases you're landing this data to do some investigation, but also some predictive analytics on that, trying to find out what will happen how can we make it happen? This is when we get into the world of machine learning and AI. And many times those data scientists like data that they can quickly get access to. So if, if, if we go through it again, we think of data warehousing with a top-down approach. It's you're going to follow this traditional method that we've been using for many, many years where you gather the requirements, you do all this work, and you create this data warehouse as opposed to a data lake, which uses this bottom-up approach, is what I can take all sorts of data. In particular, it could be data that is really difficult to put into a data warehouse. Social media data, give me everything on Twitter that people are saying about my company. It could be IoT data that's ingesting hundreds, if not millions of events per second that you need to land somewhere. You can't do that in a data warehouse. You can do, but in most cases, but you can do that in a data lake. So it's really well-defined for that data that's streaming and it then becomes a lot more frequent and also all sorts of data you can land in a data lake because the data lake is just a glorified file folder in there so I can put anything in there where a relational data warehouse is confined to relational data that's very very structured where with a data lake we can put all sorts of unstructured or semi-structured data and so once we do that we can run these queries on it, it could be batch queries interactive queries real-time analytics AI machine learning on top of that. And then if we find value of that data, it can be moved to a data warehouse, which is where we see most solutions built today. Is there a combination of a, a using a data lake and the data warehouse? So you land the data in the data lake at first. You can do all this prescriptive analytics with it. You can do one-time queries and reports. And then from, and you can do a lot of cleaning with the data, and then you can move it into a relational database. And so how does it, give me some more details you may be asking about a data lake. Why would I use a data lake in here instead of just going right to the relational data warehouse? And this slide, I'm not gonna go over everything, just a few of them, has, has grown this slide over the past few years because of all the reasons people are finding to use a data lake on there. The simplest and best use case for a data lake is if you have a data warehouse and you are Loading data in there, what usually happens is you have a maintenance window where you kick everybody off, say, at midnight, and maybe you have six hours before they, they have to get back on again. And during those six hours, you load all this data into these temporary tables, a staging area in the relational database, in the relational data warehouse. And then you load that data and then you clean all that data. And that could take a lot of time and resources to do. And the problem then is you can't have a 24 by 7 data warehouse because you've got to keep kick people off for this maintenance window. Well, at the very least, what you can do with a data lake is you do all that cleaning and processing in the data inside of a data lake. So you land all that data from a source system in a data lake. You put compute on top of the data lake because data lake is just storage. 
and then you clean all that data and land it back in the data lake. You're keeping the data warehouse going. Now, you just have a very small maintenance window, maybe just a few minutes, where you then load the data into the data lake after you've done all that cleaning. So you're extracting all that staging area from the data warehouse into the data lake. And the benefit you get out of the data lake also is you can put unlimited compute on top of that. Where in a data warehouse, you're limited by whatever that relational database is that you're using, which can still be pretty popular, uh, pretty performant, but in a data <laughs> lake, I can throw tons of compute at, unlimited if you're in the cloud on there. So you can clean that data much faster if you're willing to pay some more money for it. So that's the number one reason customers that I, I deal with are using data lake is to offload all that transformation of the data. You can also do it as the scheme on read where you can have one-time reports, one-time queries on that. You can see if this data even has value before you, instead of spending all this time creating ETL to land it in, in a relational database to find out it's, it's not useful, you can do that much easier in a data lake. And then finally, the one point I'll bring up is a data lake in any of the clouds you use is extremely cheap relative to a data warehouse. And you have different levels of storing the data to make it even cheaper on there. So in the Azure world, you have a hot, a cold, and an archive. So you have the ability to copy this data with the trade-off that it may take longer to retrieve that data but in many cases that's okay because you'll rarely, if ever, need to retrieve this data again. So you can save a lot of money by offloading it into these different folders. And also you can keep data because it's so cheap, even if you're not even sure you're going to use it, which you're never going to do in a data warehouse because you're limited in the storage and it's very costly in there. So tons of reasons to use a data lake. And with all the companies I deal with, which are mostly larger companies, are everyone's using a data lake. And then as, as I start seeing Middle-sized companies, they're all using data lakes. Maybe the smaller companies that don't have a lot of data are bypassing the data lake, but there are just so many benefits listed here that it's almost a no-brainer to use a data lake nowadays. So if I have both a data lake and a data warehouse, this slide says at a high level the way you can think of those two. Data lake can be your stage and prep area, and then your data warehouse could be your serving and security layer. And it's security listed here because there's a lot more things you can do security-wise in a data warehouse you can't do in a data lake, like rule level security and common level security and such, and a lot of things I'll touch on. So this is one way to think of it. And, and it makes it easier to kind of understand it at a high level. So when you're building this out, you'll know, hey, the data scientists with power users are gonna use a data lake, but the business people will use a data warehouse. The data lake will be where I'm doing all that data recleaning and the data warehouse as well will be serving it and, and so on. And I also point out enterprise data maturity stages. When I talk with customers, most of them are in stage two and the idea is you want to move up on this digital transformation. And stage two is where you are collecting all this data and centralize it into a data lake in the data warehouse. And that's great. And that's where many companies are at now. But once they get there, they realize they can get even more value out of the data by going to stage three and stage four, which is doing predictive analytics, taking machine learning and, and building models and, and training those models with the data that I've now collected. So instead of just looking at customer history and of the sales and seeing where the weak spots are, now you can predict customer sales. You can take this data and you can look and say, well, I predict that I'm going to have too much surplus in one area of the country and I need to move it to another area of the country. I can predict customer churn and maybe I do things with those customers, like give them, send them coupons, maybe email or things to keep them. So there's a lot of amazing things you can do with machine learning. So if you're not at that stage yet, definitely start looking into how you can get more value and make better business decisions with your data. And when you get to stage four, the thing you're going to be able to do if you build a, a good solution is there is you can collect data no more at the size of the speed or the type of the data. So you don't want to have to reinvent things a year or two down the road when you realize, oh, I can't handle streaming data or I can't handle large 
amounts of data on there. So build something that's going to last for quite a long time. This is what, this is what I'm going to get into now with the data architectures of different approaches. So if you have a, uh, any questions on there, just raise your hand, and you can. And I'll, 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 I'm paying attention to that, or put something in a chat window, and I'll be happy to answer it. And also gives me a time to rest my voice. I've been speaking a lot today. All right. So when we get into the data architectures, the one that's been around for quite a long time is the modern data warehouse. It's combining the data lake and the relational database. Here in green are solutions, products, if you're in the Azure world. But you can very easily switch these for other clouds. They, every, they all have similar products. And I break down the modern data warehouse into five phases. One, you need to ingest the data. In this case, you can use a product like Azure Data Factory to pull it from the source systems, land it into the data lake. So that's where step two comes and we store it. And now within the data lake, you have different layers. Each of those layers has folders within it. I, I will usually have customers have a raw layer. So we copy the data as is from the source system. You may have folder structures that's breaking out by source, by date, and you do these things for security and performance reasons. Then I'll use step two, three where I'll transform that data. So I can use products like Azure Data Factory data flows or Databricks or Synapse serverless or Informatica. And I will clean that data and land it back in a data lake. I can then create a presentation layer where I take that clean data and maybe I join it and aggregate it and put it into presentation layer for end users to use. My little person on with that hat is a data scientist who can right away access the data in the raw layer. That person may have the skills to access that data where it sits in there. And then the data lake, I, they can even create a sandbox for that data scientist to get a copy of the data and play with it, do, do what that person wants. Data lake design, it could be a long topic. I usually spend a, a whole day with customers going over how you want to design a data lake in there. And But for those end users, we're not data scientists who need it in a way that's much easier for them to understand it and query it. That's where step four comes in, where they model the data. So instead of being this file format structure, you copy it over into a relational database. Now IT is doing this. IT is doing this work up front. And so there's more time and more cost because more copies of the data, but the benefit is you can do self-service BI because you'll put it in the format that I can quickly and easily use a product like Power BI just to drag fields on a dashboard in a workspace and build out rep those reports and dashboards, dashboards very easily. So I may copy the data into a relational database. In the Azure world, that could be Synapse. I can have that in a third normal form. I can copy it into a star schema. And th that basically is just a way to make it easier to query the data because you don't have to join it when it's in the star schema. It's, it's, and it, every, all those relationships are already defined for the end user. So when you get to step five to visualize it, it becomes that moving fields on a dashboard and it's quite easy for them. And they can use a product like Power BI or Tableau to, to get value out of that data right away. So this has been a modern data warehouse approach that I would say maybe the last 15 years with the last six or seven being where we have a combination of data lake and relational database. And before that, it was just simply a relational database. Now where things have progressed is where people are now talking about a data fabric. And a data fabric, you can think of it as a glorified modern data warehouse. It's just adding additional features to a modern data warehouse. So sometimes people, a lot of times people are not even using the word modern data warehouse now. I'm hearing a lot of it just be called a data fabric. This is my definition. It's not a universal definition, but I think most people follow the same understanding is that a data fabric adds additional features to a data warehouse, like having sophisticated data access policies on there, adding metadata catalog so you can track the lineage of the data as it's gone through all those stages. And it could tell you with a metadata catalog what's in your data lake and what's in your relational database so you know what is available for you to query. You'll add things like master data management to their solution. You may use data virtualization products, have real-time processing, have tools for data scientists who prefer in most cases to go against 
a data lake than a relational database because most the data scientists tools work better in a file folder format. You can create APIs in order to access the data in the data fabric to make it easier for end users. And then you can finally build the data fabric in building blocks or products. So you can, for example, create a really cool data ingestion piece in data fabric. Hello? But somebody may go, well, I don't really need your data fabric, but I really like that data ingestion piece. And if you built it out, you can give them a copy of the code or use it directly within a data fabric. So think of a fabric as just these tentacles going out and making it easier to collect data no matter the size, the speed, or the type. So that's the data fabric. I'll pause there for anybody has questions. You can just come off mute. <clears throat> I have no questions. Actually, quick question. Sure. Uh, just on, I guess, more on definition, is data fabric meaning data platform? Because Azure has probably all of this uh, data access, data policies, and um, yeah, if we build in kind of ADF, we build in the you know, data bricks, we build in everything, and on top of that, like actually data bricks sell real-time processing, Azure itself has APIs, there are different products and so on and so forth. Is is this data fabric means data platform or is it a different meaning? I, I, I view a data fabric as a collection of all those tools you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is a, a platform, mm -hmm. but it's not, hey, everything's in this one box and I can just go and press a button and deploy it. Building a data fabric or any of the architectures I'm talking about is complicated, it's time consuming, it's costly. And all those tools you mentioned could be part of a data fabric and then some, and it's up to people like us to go and build these solutions or architect those solutions for other people to build. But they have to first understand what's the best approach for my use case. So as I go through these different approaches of data architectures, Hopefully one resonates more than the other. What 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 will work best for my particular use case? And if you pick one out, then you'll say, okay, now let's create an architecture based on data fabric, for example. Let's whiteboard all that out and assign products to each of those stages. And then let's go and build it. But each of those many of those products, there could be many products that you are assigning to it. Now we're trying Microsoft is trying to make it easier with a product like Synapse that you can do almost everything in Synapse, but even within Synapse, there's lots of parts that you have to learn. It could be a dedicated pool with a relational database. It could be a serverless piece. It could be Synapse Spark. It could be the data flows. There's a lot of, uh, of stuff in there that you have to learn. So Sounds good. That. Yeah, so it, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, you clarify, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, I wish there was that Hey, I got a data fabric in a box. I like but, uh, that you make an example of Synapse uh, because yeah. it makes sense to me when you say Synapse is like a data a fabric uh, with pipelines, with serving layer. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, so you can almost think of Synapse as a data fabric in a box, but it's a complicated box. And it takes a lot of skills and expertise to go and build out a data fabric or any of the data architectures we talk about, I'm talking about. Great, cool, keep the questions coming. I'll go into a data lake house. This has become popular the last couple of years to, to kind of level set what a data lake house means is to give you a one minute history of how we've got here over the years. And then in the late eighties, which is when I started, it's, it's we had things like a Teradata and Ateza that was a large data warehouse and MPP technology, multiple parallel processing, where I can handle at that time was a few gigabytes. Now it's many terabytes, if not petabytes of data. And I'm gonna put it in this relational database. I'm gonna do everything with that. All, obviously all on-prem at that time. If, if some of the, you may not remember the days we didn't have an internet, I still remember those days. And then in the late 2000s, we came out 
at this data lake concept. And so we talked about what a data lake is. Now, when it first came out, people viewed it as this wonderful landing zone that you can dump all your data in. And it was this made up of rainbows and unicorns and leprechauns and all the data would come out great. And we didn't need relational databases anymore. Huge mistake. And I have many horror stories I can talk about where customers went down that route and they failed miserably. And so people said, well, Data Lake is useful, but in a more specific use case where it's combined with the data warehouse, the relational data warehouse in there. And so I, the cloud data platform is what I talked about with the modern data warehouse. And that's been around for now 20 years, I would say, and, or, or 10 years, I would say, because the data lake's about 10, 12 years old. And that works well. It will continue to work well. But now other data architectures are coming available. One of them is the data lake house. What is the data lake house? It is using the data lake for everything. So the first thing you should be thinking is, whoa, wait a minute. You just said that failed miserably. Now we're going back to that. Yes, we are. What the difference now compared to the original data lake is this thing called Delta Lake. This is a layer on a software layer on top of data. It's not its own storage, but rather enhances a data lake by giving it features that you see in a relational database. Things like acid transactions, time travel, where you can do versioning of the data as it goes in there and, and allows you to do a tr audit trail or roll those data back. It allows you to do streaming and batch unification very easily using the same technology. It enforces schemas, so you can't have somebody put a file in your folder that's gonna have a different schema and just blow everything up. And then the biggest reason that people are using Delta Lake is it supports commands like delete, update, and merge, which you can't do in a data lake. Everything's possible with a lot of workarounds, but to do that in a data lake is a lot of code and a lot of time and performance to, to do those things that are built into a data lake that make it much easier, which is important as more and more people are trying to update data in the data lake. And then Delta Lake has a lot of performance improvement on top of that. This was made popular by Databricks came out with the data lake and then they open sourced it. And this competes against other technologies like Hudu and Iceberg as a software layer that does all the same things. In my world, Delta Lake's winning out. And I there was just an article that came out that I was interviewed for that goes into more detail on this about Delta Lake and and comparing it to those other technologies and talking a little bit about Databricks. But we've we, meaning Microsoft, has seen Delta Lake went out. And so all the products within Microsoft now are almost all the products support almost all the features of Delta Lake now. So I, we see the majority of customers when they're building a data lake, they're also adding this Delta Lake software on top of that. And it gets to the point where you can, for some use cases, say, well, actually, maybe we can get away with not using a relational database because it, we get the performance we need. We can do things like time travel and stuff that we didn't have the ability to do before, but now we can do it. And so it's it's a possibility. And think of four use cases with the data lake house that can give you a better solution than having both a data lake and a relational database. And that you have the reliability issue. If you're trying to keep the data lake and the warehouse consistent, you could have issues if an ETL breaks on there. You can, you'll have data staleness in there. The data warehouse will always be older because you're copying it from the data lake into the data warehouse. That problem goes away because with a data lake house, you're having one copy of the data. It's also beneficial in most cases for the data scientists because they're using machine learning tools that don't work well on warehouses, but work well on data lake house. So you make the data scientists people happy. And then even though storage is cheap, 
you're reducing your cost maybe in half because you only have to have one copy. So this sounds great, but there are problems with having just a data lake house, which is comprised of Delta Lake. And that's what I list here. Re speed, you're never gonna get a Delta Lake to be as fast as a relational database, especially when that relational database is somewhat, something like Synapse, which got this massive parallel processing. Now this may be okay. Maybe in a Delta Lake, it takes three seconds and a query, the same query and the same data in Synapse could take three milliseconds, but maybe it doesn't matter. It all depends on that SLA that the end users require, but it's something you need to be aware of. There's not the security, as I mentioned before, in a data lake or a delta lake that you'll see in a relational database like role level security, column level, dynamic data masking. A problem too with a delta lake is the metadata is either within the file or some separate file somewhere that talks about the metadata related to the files sitting in that folder. That could be complicated to figure out for end users. And as opposed to a relational database, data warehouse, that the metadata sits on top of the data and they're, they're linked. And you have to get to, you can not you can only get to the data going through the metadata. And that's much more easier to, to look through at a data warehouse because the work's done up front for you to, to make it this easier. So end users who are used to a relational database may have trouble with a data lake where it's a file folder based world. And then things like concurrency, you can struggle performance wise with a Delta Lake that you don't have in a lot of the relational data warehouses. There, there's missing features in a data lake like referential integrity. A big one is having to use Spark SQL. If you're in the Databricks world and you're using Delta Lake, it's SQL, ANSI SQL, but it's could be just enough to cause a lot of problems with end users who used to say T-SQL in the Microsoft world. So you gotta be aware of there's training and change involved, which a lot of people are pose and, it's, and it can be troublesome. And then people are just maybe just used to relational database. So you gotta take that into account. Now this has changed in the Azure world with the product Synapse because there's a serverless piece on that. And that serverless piece allows you to create a view on top of data sitting in a Delta Lake. And if you think of a view, it's SQL pointing to a file and inside that SQL, it could be a, a create table statement that defines the fields that are inside of that file. So you're creating metadata on top of a file and that view can be used by an end user and they can use T-SQL on top of that. And to them, it may appear, they may think that files, that, that they're actually querying a relational database. They, they could not even be made aware it's a folder, it's a file in a, in a folder somewhere. So this is what's changed a lot of things because I can use that view within any product like SSMS or Tableau or Power BI. And that extra work of creating that view makes it very easy for end users to query the data. So some of these concerns go away, like not being able to use T-SQL. You can also do th put things on top of that, like real level security. And added on to that, if you're using Synapse Serverless along with Power BI, I could query that view and pull that data with that view into Power BI, which has this import mode, and that data is then stored in memory in Power BI. So if I'm creating dashboards on top of that, I get the millisecond response time. So that knocks out some more of these concerns, like the speed. You can also do rule of security on that. The metadata is, is stored in that view. So you, you, you solve that problem in there. So where I'm starting to see some change is that customers are coming up with use cases where I go, hmm, that actually could work fine 
using just a data lake house, which is the Delta Lake and Synapse and Power BI. Now, if you're not using Synapse and Power BI and you're using other tools, you'd have to see if those tools can work just as well as those products. But this is where I started seeing a, a bit of a sea of change in there. However, I will say 90% of the time I, I would is you're going to still want to have both a data, data lake, delta lake, and a relational database. Now you could, what I tell some customers is try a data lake house approach until it doesn't work anymore. So maybe you start loading data in there, cleaning in there, querying it in there, ingesting in the Power BI, and see if that works. And if it gives you everything you need. If not, it's not much of a hassle then to go and copy that data into a relational database because maybe you don't get the performance you need or you're doing a lot of ad hoc queries. So you can't do that in Power BI, so you need to go right against the source. And if that source is a file with a billion rows in there, it's gonna take forever. So yeah, that's a use case where you wanna copy it into Azure in a, in a dedicated pool and query that data. Now, there are other enhancements going on in the Microsoft world, which I can't talk about yet that make this even data like house even more compelling. One little thing that, well, it's kind of a big thing, but part of a bigger approach Microsoft's going to take in the future was data marts, which just came out. And I'm gonna have a blog out coming out tomorrow which explains that in more detail. So this, this adds a little more features that could make you get away with not using a relational database, at least for smaller, smaller being 100 gigs or under department-wide solutions, but not an enterprise solution. Power BI is not for building a huge enterprise solution, which will be another blog I'm coming out with. But this is one step in a process that Microsoft's going to come out with that makes that's going to make a data lake house more of a percentage of use cases that could use it. So stay tuned for that. I wish I could say more, but I can't yet. All right, so I'll pause for questions on that before I jump to a data mesh. Um, there is one question in the chat. I'm not too sure if you had a chance to um, answer that, that one from Julia. Oh yeah, I see it. Okay, Julia asks, in case of a client supply, a snapshot of, of once a month in a transactional data, where some of those transactions may change the status of others, what would be the best submission, uh, efficient data lake? So the idea is, if she says, should we avoid to store unchanged transactions and store those that have changed, or just put the whole snapshot? So that's, that's an interesting question because there are a couple of different approaches. I've seen customers take snapshots of the, of the data and just create a daily snapshot with, and it's all the data on there. That's one way you can do it. Now, what's changing is because of Delta Lake having time travel is now you can, and, and, and supporting the update and merge statement is now you can start using those to update the data. So instead of having that, I'll call it old school approach of creating the snapshots, now you can update that data directly inside of a data lake, a delta lake in there. Now, it, there's that saying it depends because you have to look at how much data you're talking about, what's the structure of it. If you're talking about a source system that every day you're getting many terabytes of data, obviously you don't want to copy the, an, a, of a database that's already maybe many terabytes. You don't want to do a flush and fill if you take a, a snapshot of it, it's too much. So you want to do incremental updates. So you can do incremental updates and there's a lot of ways to do that. You can do a Spark notebook and do incremental updates in there. And so that's where uh, a lot of customers use a Delta Lake with Spark notebooks for that. You can use Azure Data Factory and they have data flows and other approaches to do incremental updates of that and update that while it's sitting in the, the Delta Lake on there. Or you can dump files every day into the data Delta Lake and then update a relational database with those changes if if that's where most, if not all, of your end users are going to access the data. So it's it's a long, even longer answer that I can I can talk through about. 
this is where I get with customers, we just start whiteboarding and I have to ask them a lot of questions about the size and the speed and the type of the data and what technologies they know and are using the cloud. And then we can come up with a better answer for you. So I'm happy, Julia, to talk more about your use case offline. We can even arrange a call and, and I can go through that with you. Okay, anybody else just jump off? If not, I will go into data mesh. I'm sure most of you have heard about the data mesh. It's become the talk of the town. And the difference between what I previously talked about and the data mesh is at a very high level, think of the data mesh decentralizing the data where and the, the decentralizing the workloads where everything else I talked about, the idea is I'm taking all the data from these source systems and I'm copying it into a central location, which is owned by IT. Data Mesh says, let's not do that. Let's keep everything separate and create domains that own the data and the data stays in the domain that's not being centralized. And then, we treat data as a product. So I'll get to that in a second. So this is at a very high level, the data mesh. I'm going to go a little bit more into that. I will say that the data mesh is sounding really great in theory. And I don't, some people don't like this slide, but I put it up anyway, because a, and I want to explain data mesh is not a con is a concept. It's not technology. So it's an idea of decentralizing it. If you want to go and build it, you have to go and talk to vendors like Microsoft of how are they going to go and solve this data architecture? And it sounds great in theory, but there are a lot of challenges with the data mesh and it's not for everybody. I will say it's for a very small percentage of customers. Data mesh and this, this took me probably a year to try to break it down and explain it easy and hopefully you get it when I go through this slide. There's four principles of, about a, of a data mesh. The first is domain ownership. The idea is we decentralize the data and it stays with each of these domains. So I could have a domain like manufacturing sales and supplier, and they maintain ownership of the data. They know the data best. They're going to ones that are going to clean it and they are going to tr to have that complete ownership as opposed to IT having ownership of it. Which if you've been around a long time like me, you've probably seen, and you're involved in data health projects, you've probably seen a lot of arguments over who owns data. Those go away because wherever the data's come from, that source of them, they maintain ownership of it. Now they have to keep treat data as a product, which is principle number two, meaning if I'm in manufacturing, I now have to create the infrastructure and the domain teams, like a mini IT team, to go and take the source data and make it in an analytical format. So I, I use it, I put it in a data lake in a data warehouse, and then I make it available for others to access. Maybe I write API code so they can access the metadata to find what's in there, and then they can use other API to actually query the data. So they're treating data as a product. So each domain would follow some sort of contract that would allow that data to be used by others outside of their domain. Principle three is self-service data infrastructure as a platform. And the idea is if I have all these domains and some customers can have hundreds of domains, I want to make it easy for a new domain or, or existing domain to go and create data as a product. So I want to have ideally a button they press and push and they get the storage and the compute and the ETL and all the security done for them. And then they just build their domain within that infrastructure that's created for them automatically. So that's where number three is very important part of the principle. Number four is, well, if I have all these domains, maybe hundreds of them, I could have some standards. 
I can't buy, have everybody go into doing their own data quality and security. One domain thinks I'm going to clean data and make the states uh, abbreviation. Another one keeps the full name. I'm going to have somebody who thinks this, data, this is the way to clean data and, and somebody thinks differently. So I have to create all these policies dealing with security and quality and regulations and even how to model the data. So I need a governing body that's going to govern all of these domains. So this is the four principles. This is not easy to understand. It literally took me a year before I think it finally clicked after rereading and rereading about data mesh and then trying to, un trying to understand it and then explain it easy enough for, for, and for people to understand. And this was brought up, up again, says Jumak, she, her links here, she started the data mesh concept a couple of years ago. And it's, as she explains, it's a big mind shift where you go from this centralized ownership to decentralized, where pipeline gets reduced, where data is treated as a product, where you have, instead of having a IT team that's massive, you now have small IT teams all across your company. Now, where it gets confusing, if you're not confused already, is I say this data mesh decentralized, but there are pieces that are centralized. So if we go through those four principles again, principles one and two are decentralized. Data ship ownership and data as a product. But where we centralize it is that data infrastructure is a platform. There's got to be a central team that's building that solution to allow you to click a button to go and deploy those domains and create them. So that's, that's a centralized piece as well as the ecosystem. You have to centralize governance. You can't everybody doing their own thing. So that will be a centralized team that will be created. So that's where people get confused. It's not everything is decentralized. Pieces are still being centralized. So the use cases for data mesh, the four of them are helping with ownership. Ideally, the, those arguments will go away about who owns the data. Lack of quality, who knows the data best is the people who are inside that domain. So let them clean the data because they will do it best. And then the biggest thing about data mesh is scaling and two, two factors. One is organizational scaling. If I have a central IT team and they're ingesting hundreds of data sources and more and more data sources are coming in, they're going to become a bottleneck because there's only one team. Now, if I use a data mesh and if I have each of the domains having their own mini IT team, then I'm scaling out instead of just trying to scale up. So I can add new domains, but I add new people. So this allows me to do the organizational scaling. And so more domains, not a problem. I just get more people. And there's infrastructure gets to the second part, technical scaling, instead of being limited by what IT has built, which is going to have some cap at how much they can handle, I can use the data mesh and each of those domains has their own infrastructure. So I'm scaling out again. So if I have more domains, no problem. I just add more infrastructure for those domains. Right now, this is where there's a lot of arguments back and forth because people with the, who are big proponents of data mesh will say all these data warehousing solutions are failing because they're not scaling. But I've seen otherwise. I see plenty of solutions being built with those data, other data architectures that are centralizing that are being able to handle massive amounts of data because the technology is growing and keeping up with a lot of it. Still have the organizational scaling problem, but technically you can kind of solve a lot of, of that part of it, but not all of it. So there are some very good use cases for data mesh when this becomes a big problem. Now, if we look at the data mesh, the way we create these domains, this is where it gets very complicated. And domain design can spend months with customers on there because you have to have these domains which start out source aligned, but that could be too confusing for end users. So you may need to make a copy of that data that's more consumer aligned, more friendly for people outside the domain to understand. You also may have aggregate domains, which are combining multiple domains into one because it would be too slow to have 
queries and reports run against data that's sitting in many domains and that needs to be combined. So instead we pre-combine all that data into an aggregate domain and then the consumer can use it. Now this is a simple drawing because I can have domains go calling to other domains and aggregate domains going to other domains. So this is where customers really struggle because of the, the, the way they got to design all the domain, domains, even figuring out what domains are can be very challenging. So that's something to keep in mind. So that leads into a lot of concerns with the data mesh. These could be fine in some cases with end users. Maybe they look at this and they say, oh, I'm fine with the organizational change that'll be and the technical implementation it's gonna make. But I find a lot of customers are, are not open to, to the radical change that data mesh brings on there. So you have to be aware of these, go through them all. And if you get through all these and you go like, hey, this is no problem, then okay, maybe a data mesh will work for you. But if you look at this and go, well, I'm gonna have a problem getting all these IT groups because I can't even find quality people. Now I gotta do it for every domain. And then if you go to all these domains who may or all feeding the data to central IT now, and you tell them, hey, you gotta change your approach. You have to hire an IT team, IT team, you have to have the budget, you have to now follow this contract and become part of this data mesh. They may go, look, I don't have enough time for all that. I can barely keep things afloat. Now you want me to do all this stuff? If you want the data, take it. Why should I do this? If you say, well, it's for the greater good, that may not fly. And that's where I see the biggest problem with customers. Now all it takes is one person, one domain to say, we're not gonna be part of it. Now you're in a lot of trouble. So you have to centralize that. So where you're starting to see customers go down that route is they have a hybrid approach where they centralize data and then they start breaking off domains into a data mesh, but most of it is still being centralized. Now, maybe down the road, they'll convince everybody else or most of them to go to a data mesh, but I think what you'll see is that combination. So you have to see these concerns. And the final one that I'll just talk about is the big picture is if all these domains are creating their own solution, they are just thinking about what's gonna work best for their data. They're not gonna worry or care about a bigger picture of combining all this data. So you still need somebody that's gonna have a more holistic approach. And that's where it can be very challenging because now they have to take all this data that may not be in the ideal format for, from all these domains and pull it into a format that's going to have a, a larger data model made up of many of those domains on that. So that's a big change. And I will point out, Jamek had this in her, in her book on, on eight categories that you have to look at for your company to see if a data mesh may be good for you. And you have to score medium to high in all these categories. And I would argue you need to score higher in all these categories. So many customers can look at this and go, whoa, we're not early adopters. So boom, probably 90% of companies don't do a data mesh. Are you tech at core? Do you have a domain oriented organization, which is, something that only the largest companies have. So this is not for some small or even most medium-sized companies is because they're not big enough in a way to have this domain. Maybe they only have 10 sources of data, so they don't need to go to this extravagant lens, length of building on a data mesh. So there's a lot of things that, to look at because the data mesh is going to take more time and more cost than any of the other approaches. It could have its benefits and it could be the way to go, but you have to be aware of all the trade-offs and maybe you, you will look at the other architectures and go, well, in my situation, those other architecture, architects are better. And then finally, just a couple of slides on if you're using Azure, my, Microsoft has what they call cloud scale analytics. This is a way to build out what they call data landing zone, the data management zone. This is the underlying data lake that you would build for not just the data mesh, but you could use it for other products on there. And so you'd want to learn about this. So this is getting towards the principle number three, where it does at least a part of that, where you can click a button and build out at least your storage, your data link on, on that. So, so take a look at this. We did a presentation a month, over a month ago now that talked about 
that previous slide and then how to use it to build out a data mesh. So if you go to this link there, there's a lot of presentations and documentation on building out a data mesh using the Microsoft products. There's further links here that you can use to get more information about building a data mesh on Azure. As I said, I'll make this available, this deck. And then I wanted to talk about different types of data mesh. The first type being the one on the left where it's more centralized in that, but there are trade and the trade-offs that come with that. Now, in, in this mesh type one is what I call it, is all the domains are using the same technology. And then the data lake, and this is Microsoft approach, is centralized, but each domain gets its own container or folder that only they have access to. So this is the most common approach we see customers building in Azure is this type one approach. So there's more centralization, but it's easier to build because of centralized, more performant and using the same technology. We go to mesh type two, so we get more to distributed, in which case each domain has its own storage. So they will have their own container. Now the challenge could be, well, if I need to combine all this data, these domains could be located anywhere across the world. So I have a performance issue now. I also have a security issue of how am I going to connect all those storages all over the world together on that. So I don't see many customers using data mesh type two. Type three is where we go and add the ability to any domain can use any technology they want. So one domain could say, I'm going to use Azure. Another can say, I'm going to use AWS. Another could be saying they're using Google. I've not seen any cus customers go to this length. Just imagine, imagine how challenging that principle three and four would be if you had to now create a solution, a one button that's going to go and create a domain, but you have to ask, well, what, what cloud do you want to use? And what products do you want to use within that cloud? Really challenging. And then type four, uh, principle four is trying to govern all that. It's hard enough governing everything under one cloud, but now you have to govern under a different cloud and different products. So this is where most customers, they're in my world, all using Azure, only using Azure. And then within Azure, they're using a limited subset of products in there. So maybe they say, okay, you can use Data Factory, you can use Analyt, um, Synapse, you can use maybe Cosmos DB, but you can't use anything else because that's going to that's gonna be too much for us to, to govern. So last slide in the end is, as I mentioned before, my view, not Microsoft, is you'll see this, uh, this approach where it's a hybrid, where you have a centralized solution and then building of data mesh, sort of a hub and spoke. And that's because of principle number three, which I haven't, there's no platform out there you can buy to do that. Every company's got to kind of build their own, which is going to cause a lot of problems with customers trying to do this ideal data mesh and decentralize everything. They may go to the centralized approach with caveat, with some offshoots of data mesh in there. And I think this is what you'll see. And then over time, a company may say, well, We'll go start out with any new domains are going to be data mesh, and then we'll start migrating some domains over time that are centralized into a data mesh approach. And will we ever get a client, a customer that has a complete data mesh that everything is decentralized? Maybe, I haven't seen any yet. And then there's always an argument too, well, are you even building a data mesh if you're not following all four principles? And I have a lot of customers who are following principle one and two, but not really three and four, and they call it a data mesh. I don't know, maybe you can. There's a lot of arguments over this topic on there. I've seen people come out and I'll just put virtualization on top of everything and that's a data mesh. No, because you're not solving any of the four principles. You're not solving domain ownership. Your IT is still owning it. You're just keeping it separate, but you're not transferring ownership of that. So this is where it's got very confusing out there and everybody is saying that they have a data mesh and they can build you a data mesh and nobody really has a solid answer of what a data mesh is or 
something like a minimal viable product to define what a data mesh is. But hopefully, I've given you some high-level understanding of what all these different data architectures are with a data, modern data warehouse, a data fabric, a data lake house, and a data mesh. I know it's a lot to consume in one hour. If you have, I'll take some questions now. If you have follow-on questions, you feel free to email me. I have some more topics, uh, in-depth topics on this subject in my blog. Um, but happy to have follow-up conversations with, with you. And and with that, I'll see if anybody has questions. If feel free to come off mute, if you like. Hopefully, nobody's head has exploded with all this confusion. Again, <laughs> I can't stress enough. This is a lot. I it took me a, literally a year to make this deck. And I was, and I've been in the industry 35 years. I'm going, I'm going, I don't quite understand this. Simplify it for me, somebody. And I, and that's part of what I do in my blog. I try to simplify it. Talk to me like I'm a fifth grader so I can understand this. And I still struggle with the, with the data mesh. And there's still lots of arguments with people of, of what it is and what it is not. And I think that's going to be a big challenge for the data mesh to be implemented if nobody can agree what it actually is. Um, but Maybe some of you have some more understanding, and if you're going to build out a data warehouse solution, you can go along that right path and do more research on each on the one topic you figure out that I've discussed, the one architecture that will fit better for your use case. One question that I do have is, um, so you're kind of saying that it was like a smaller to mid-sized data mesh is not a great architecture for kind of smaller to mid size organizations, but as those organizations grow, do you think the data mesh architecture is like what they should be aspiring to? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I've, I've had this conversation with customers who say, look, we're not big enough for data mesh now, but we hope to be in a year or two. Should we start the data mesh now? And I would say, yeah, that's probably a good idea because maybe starting it now will get make it easier to get all that buy-in and it won't be a data mesh if, if if you have an infrastructure now it could take a long time to convert so if it's something small now convert it now and, and, and it'll be easier to add things on there or if it's greenfield you're just starting a brand new company you can you start with the data mesh and in most cases, you're gonna you're not, you're gonna start a company that's very small, so a data mesh would be complete overkill. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you may be at okay. Now we've grown enough; we see a further growth. Maybe we want to convert to a data mesh now. Now, in my experience, I haven't seen any bodies who's with a new company, Greenfield, start with a data mesh. It's always been, look, we're having all these challenges with data ownership, with scaling. Nothing's working. Let's go to a data mesh and convert. And that's where I've seen it. And it's not a six month to a year. It's usually two or three years to go and convert to a data mesh. But they feel like it's worth it because of all the problems we're having now. And they see additional growth that's just going to add on to the problems. So let's start now and convert it. That makes sense. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Um... I'm not a data engineer, but I was actually able to follow along a little bit with that. So <laughs> you did a really good. great job That's explaining. That's what I want. Yeah. <laughs> I, I say if I can go explain it to my wife or kids and they get it, then I'm doing good. <laughs>